Welcome everyone. Um, it's a privilege I get to be here and share this message with you. I've actually been waiting for many months to be able to share this message with you. And as I was um, writing it, I said, Joel, I just can't do it in one message. I need two weeks. <laughs> so I'll be um, speaking this week as part one. And then in two weeks time will be part two. I'll be speaking on the oil of gladness today. Let's start with the text, John 15, verse five. These are the words of Jesus. He said, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burnt. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you would bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in His love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Galatians 5.22 But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, that's what we're focusing on, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. There are no laws against these things. Psalm 45 verse seven and repeated in Hebrews one verse nine says, you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore God, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. The oil of gladness beyond your companions. It feels like I'm bringing you more than a message on joy today. And I think that's because this is so much more than a message for me. This is a testimony, a testimony that was hard fought for. See, joy is a spring of water that the Lord led me to when I was wandering through a desert of unanswered prayers and painful circumstance. He taught me how to drink deeply from the spring of joy. And I will do that for the rest of my life. Joy is a gift from God. It's an incredible gift from the Father. But sometimes in hard times, we don't know how to reach out and receive this wonderful gift that is accessible to us. Joy can also be an impartation of the Holy Spirit. And I've experienced that. And for the last couple of weeks, I've been interceding on your behalf. And I've been praying that today you would experience an impartation from the Holy Spirit and that you would be anointed with the oil of gladness. And I love seeing that our answer to prayers, that depression has been breaking off. And I believe this is the work that He's doing. And so I've been praying that you would receive that anointing today. I'm gonna pray and we'll get into it. Let's pray, join with me. Our Holy Father, our giver of good gifts, we ask that You would open our hearts and minds to receive an individual and collective revelation of Your joy that is accessible to us. We thank You, Lord, for this heavenly gift. We thank You that You did not intend for us to receive this gift only when we enter life in heaven, but that we know that we would know this gift here and now in the land of the living. Lord, even as we walk through those dark valleys of life, Father, would You bless today. Jesus, would You speak today. And Holy Spirit, would You impart today. All for Your glory. Amen. Amen, amen. Thanks so much, guys. Um, you may have heard me share once before this year that um, 
I have been practising joy, that I, um, I set aside Wednesdays, every Wednesday is my joy day. <laughs> And it's the day that I practice joy. I learn about it, I study it, and I put it into practice. Well, as I've been doing studying, I came across this amazing sermon from Charles Spurgeon. And he shared this kind of metaphor around joy. And he shared that if you're carrying something light, imagine, it, imagine you're carrying something light, physically light, then you could show your spare strength by perhaps you could jump, you could run, you could like chat for ages carrying this light thing. You can see that the person has strength to spare, right? But if that same person with that same amount of strength was carrying something really heavy, you don't see the excess strength, right? Because it's using all of their strength to carry it. You're not seeing that excess. Same amount of strength. And he said, the same goes for joy. When someone is going through a light trial, maybe times are a bit easy, the wind is in their sails, you can see their excess joy by smiling, by laughter, maybe they're being spontaneous. You can visibly see the excess joy. And someone who's going through a tough trial might have that same amount of joy but you're using all of it just to keep afloat. And I thought that was such an amazing revelation because for me, I started this journey on joy because I thought I had lost it. And here I realised that I had not lost my joy, but all of it was being put to good use, just to keep afloat in a tough season. And so when times are tough, and we think out we've lost our joy, but perhaps it's all been put to use. The question is, is there a way to have more? When all our stores of joy are being deployed just to keep afloat, is there a way to get more? Can we be a person with excess? What does it look like to be someone who's anointed with the oil of gladness? C.S. Lewis said this, he said, if you want to get warm, you must stand near a fire. If you want to get wet, you must get into the water. If you want joy, power, peace, eternal life, you must get close to or even into the thing that has them. So right after Jesus promised the Holy Spirit, He said these words, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit, but apart from me, you can do nothing. If we look at this, at the biology of this metaphor, we've got Jesus, we've got the vine, right? And the vine draws nutrients, it draws water from the roots, it sends them up the vine, out to the branches, and the branches receive the water and the nutrients drawn from the roots up the vine, and they can bear good fruit. So we imagine that Jesus is the vine, and that His roots go deep into the Father's love, and that the water and the nutrients from the Father's love it travels up the branches to the vine, to the branches, up the vine to the branches, and they will receive the nutrients in the water. So we imagine that Jesus is the vine and the nutrients that are coming up and out to the branches of the, is the work of the Holy Spirit. It is power, it is grace, it is His counsel, it is His comfort. And when these nutrients flow up the vine and to the branches, we bear good fruit the fruit of love, peace, joy. This to me speaks of endless supply. It speaks of endless supply. So when I'm putting all of my joy to good use and it feels like there isn't any spare, when I'm connected to the vine, which is Christ, I am on the receiving end of an endless supply that comes from the very depths of Christ rooted in the love of the Father. And so it becomes a supernatural kind of fruit. It becomes a kind of fruit that people would look on and say, it does not make sense that you could bear this kind of fruit in this season. 
Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. I'm a branch. You're a branch. You're a branch. You're a branch. How come some branches bear more fruit than others? I wondered. Do we just go about life and the Holy Spirit just does the work of producing the fruit? Or does God just favour some more than others? Why do some branches bear more fruit than others? Well, I think the people that bear this kind of fruit know this. They know that it's His work. They know that it's His fruit, but they know it requires their participation. It requires our effort. It requires our invitation and it requires our faith. So what does it look like to participate with the Holy Spirit to bear this kind of fruit, to bear the fruit of joy? I think it starts by having the attitude of a student. It starts by having the attitude of a student. So I was a terrible student at school. Was anyone else a terrible student? Yeah, a couple of hands raised. You were all sitting at the back. <laughs> so good. Perhaps, you know, I don't know. I'll just leave that for you. Um, bad student. Um, and, and I remember my best friend, she was a great student and she was so, uh, she was just so studious. And we were, a part, we were at the same class. We had the same teacher. The teacher was teaching the same content. Yet at the end of the year, she had all of this knowledge that I didn't. Why? Same class, same teacher, same content. She came with the desire to learn. She came with her notebooks. She came to participate. She wrote things down if she didn't understand it. She asked questions of the teacher of her peers, not me clearly, because I wasn't listening. And at the end, she had knowledge that I did not have. She participated in the lessons in order to learn. And I know that those that participate with the Holy Spirit, those that put in the effort, those that are ready to learn and obey will bear fruit, more fruit than other branches. So last year or when I started my joy days and oh my gosh, I love them. <laughs> Wednesday is my favourite day of the week. <laughs> With, I, you know, I started to practice joy and I studied and, and I would learn and I would apply what I learned and it was tested and, and it wasn't always easy. But I learned how God wired me to enjoy the simple things. I learned how He wired me to enjoy our creation, to enjoy my family, to, to enjoy. On Wednesdays, I put on a dress that I love to wear. <laughs> I listen to music that I love. I, I choose like a dinner that I really want to cook. I choose good food. I spend time with the people that I love. I put the pressure of the to-do list away so I can enjoy their company. And listen, I always say it's not selfish day. It's not do whatever you want to make you happy. That's the rhetoric of the world. It is enjoy the life I have today, day. <laughs> it's that if nothing changed, if no prayers were answered, if nothing changed, it's finding joy in the life God has given me today. I became a student of joy. And so I learned some things. There are three essential things to a life that bear the fruit of joy. Those that bear the fruit of joy practice praise and thanksgiving. Those that bear the fruit of joy practice th praise and thanksgiving. I've learned how interlinked the joy of the Lord is with praise and with thanksgiving. And I've also learned that a song of praise doesn't naturally bubble up in a season of intense trial, does it? Praise is one of those things like smiles and laughter. It comes naturally in a time of excess where the trials are lighter than our stores of joy. Um, about four, over a year ago, a year and a bit ago, um, we got to buy a new home and it was so exciting. And, um, and I really love it. It's been a massive doer upper. So, I mean, if we're not working, we're working. Um, but it's been really wonderful. But as um, I was standing in that backyard um, after we had brought it, before we had moved in, I had this word from the Holy Spirit and He said that this house, this place, this land would be a place of freedom and joy. 
freedom and joy. And I was like, yes, (laughs) amen. (laughs) Bring it on, freedom and joy. But then not long after that, I just remember sitting there kind of in shock as I saw people mark out the boundary of our home to be a prison um, for one of my loved ones to share, to do a sentence. And I was, I was so sad, so, so distressed, so much pain. And I remember saying to God, uh, hang on a minute, you said freedom, you said joy, I have an actual prison here and a lot of pain. So what's that about? (laughs) It's the opposite. Did I hear wrong? And I had to ask myself, whose word is sovereign? Whose word is sovereign? And will I walk by faith and not by sight? I was led to a story in Acts and Paul and Silas were put in prison. And it says that in Acts 16, 25, at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and they sung praises to God. That means to rejoice. That means to have joy. They sung praises to God and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately the doors were open and everyone's bands were loosed. I felt God say to me, you do the praise, you do the joy, I'll bring the freedom. You do the praise, you do the joy, and I'll, be the fr- and I'll bring the freedom. You know, it's not that easy to praise in a prison. And perhaps for you, the prison is, might be a sickness. It feels like your body has been a prison. Maybe it's men- mental health. Maybe it's a situation out of your control. But Jesus said this, if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. And that goes for those who are in prison seasons. That goes for those whose trials are greater than their stores of joy. And look, in that place, it is not possible to bear the fruit of joy apart from Christ. Christ, but when we praise God, when we worship Him, we are participating with the Holy Spirit whose work is to edify and bring glory to Christ. And as we do that, we will bear the fruit of joy. Psalm 1611 says, You make known to me the path of life, and in your presence there is what? The fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. How do we enter His presence? With praise and with thanksgiving. And we will experience the fullness of joy. You'll start to feel that that supernatural joy be drawn from the vine and into your life and you will bear that fruit. Those that bear the fruit of joy practice praise and thanksgiving. Those that bear the fruit of joy, they live for the approval of Christ alone. They live for the approval of Christ alone. How easily do we slip into the joyless place of wanting the approval of others? And I tell you, God did not go to all the effort knitting you together in your mother's womb with such intention and purpose for you then to be reshaped in order to please others in your life. He alone is the one that should shape us. He is the potter and we are the clay. And the minute we try to shape ourselves so that others will accept us, we have lost the joy of embracing our true selves. And our true self will lose the joy of connection with others and with God because the person that we're trying to be, that false self is the one receiving the connection and you aren't. The Bible says this, our purpose is to please God, not people. He examines the motives of our hearts. I'm a recovering people pleaser. (laughs) I am. (laughs) There might be a few of you in the room. And look, the Holy Spirit, He gave me a tool to help me with this. 
So he gave me this picture. And this picture was an empty room. And there was a platform, kind of like this. And on that platform was a chair. And every time I was worried about what someone would think, or I was just worried about whether they'd be happy, whether they'd be pleased or not pleased, I would imagine that person sitting in that seat. And the Holy Spirit, uh, Holy Spirit gave me that picture. And then I walked up to that person and I said to them, I'm sorry, this is not your seat. This is not your seat. Because in my life, God is the only one who gets that seat. He's the only one that gets to sit on that elevated seat and tell me who I am and who I can be in Him. You know what happens when we put man on that seat, when we're trying to please them? Do you know what you get? You get someone with limited grace. You get someone with limited mercy, with limited wisdom, with limited sight. And it's no wonder that we walk around with not enough in our cup. Oh, but when God is on that seat, mercy, grace, love, wisdom, truth, it's abundant. And we become like David who declares in Psalm 23, my cup overflows because I live for the approval of Christ alone. I tell you, the more I leave people pleasing in my past, the more joy I carry. And this is what I believe it means to be anointed with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Because it says that in in Psalm 45, 7, you have loved righteousness and you have hated wickedness. Therefore, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. When He is the one we are wanting to please, what He loves and what He hates begins to matter more to us than what other people love and what other people hate. It doesn't mean that we don't care about how people are experiencing us. We listen and we do our best to live at peace with one another, but that's different to letting what they do like and letting what they don't like shape who you are. We cannot have the fear of man and fear of God at the same time. And fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And I tell you, you will see a harvest of joy like you never have before when you start dethroning the people in your life saying, look, I love you, but this is not your seat. The seat is reserved for the Lord God alone. And it's His approval that I seek. And I'm gonna be then walking around with a full cup Because from Him, I get unlimited grace. I get unlimited mercy. I get unlimited love. I get all that I need. Those that that bear the fruit of joy live the approval of Christ alone. And those that bear the fruit of joy, they never lose the joy of their salvation. They never lose the joy of their salvation. Oh, I remember so clearly the joy I felt when I was saved. But the reality is, I've been saved, I'm being saved, and I will be saved. You have been saved, you are being saved, and you will be saved. So if salvation is not a one-time thing, then joy in our salvation should not be a one-time thing either. Isaiah 12 verse 3 says, You will draw water from the wells of salvation. You will draw water from the wells of salvation. And I love this imagery. I love this imagery because our salvation is a deep well that we can continually draw from. Each day you can with joy draw peace from knowing that you are in the right standing with the Father. With joy, you can draw up faith that the cross is enough, that you've been forgiven, that you've been set free from sin and death. With joy, you can draw up confidence because of the cross that you've been given the authority and dominion over darkness. 
With joy, you can draw hope that one day as you breathe your last, you will be welcomed into an eternal home by your Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. You can draw from the well that of salvation all the days of your life and it will never run dry. And it is a well that you can lead others to drink from, others who are thirsty, and you can offer them living water that they would never thirst again. Those that bear the fruit of joy never lose the joy of their salvation. It's a well that they drink from every day. I love in the Psalms, in the Psalms it says to sing salvation songs. <laughs> Psalm 96 says, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless His name. Tell of His salvation from day to day. Tell of His salvation from day to day. I think I'm finishing so you can come on up. Curtis, is that you? Those who bear the fruit of joy, they practise praise and thanksgiving. For in God's presence, there is the fullness of joy. Those who bear the fruit of joy live for the approval of Christ alone, for they know the joy of His affirming love. Those who bear the fruit of joy never lose joy in their salvation. In gratitude, they draw from that well all the days of their life. What do these things have in common? Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. You will bear much fruit. I have some good news for you. If you have been carrying a heavy burden, if you have been walking through a trial that is heavy, when someone has been carrying something physically heavy over a long period of time, when they finally put down that heavy item and they pick up something lighter, do they have more strength or less than when they started? They have more, right? They've built up more capacity for strength. So, so if you've been going through something tough and this too shall pass, do you think you will have more joy or less than when you started? More. Can you imagine the excess? Can you imagine the joy that is coming? If you can learn to have joy when times are tough, can you imagine how it is gonna feel when this passes? It's Psalm 126. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. That's what we have to look forward to. And imagine, okay, that's what we have to look forward to here. Imagine, imagine the feeling when we enter heaven's gates. Revelation 2.4, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things would have passed away. Oh, the glorious, eternal gift, the joy that is waiting for us, for those who trust in Jesus. Gosh, I found that through practice, even in the toughest times, even in the hardest of days, I've found my stores of joy growing. Because in Jesus, I've learnt how to tap into the endless supply. Please know this, and I'll go into this more in part two, that that doesn't mean you'll be endlessly happy. Happiness is an emotion Joy is more of a state of being. It's the fruit of your choices. But I've tapped into the endless supply. But I don't know about you, but I wanna be one of those branches that bear much fruit. Life's too short to walk around down in the dumps. <laughs> Life's too short to not embrace the gifts that we have right now, that if nothing changed in your life, there is goodness in your life. 
God has put His creation there for you to enjoy, people there for you to enjoy. Life's too short not to embrace all of the gifts that He has given us. As I said in the beginning of this message, I've been praying for you, I've been interceding for you, that you would experience an impartation from the Holy Spirit today, that you would be anointed with the oil of gladness. The oil represents the Holy Spirit. And so what I want us to do is I'd love for you to stand with me. I'd love for you to let your faith rise. And I believe for for some of you more than others, you know you've been walking around with a real heaviness. I just pray as we praise and worship God today, that His Holy Spirit would break the power of that heaviness, of that cloak, of that oppression, of that depression, and that you would receive the oil of gladness and that you would know what it is to have a heart full of joy in the Lord. Let's pray and then we'll worship our God. He is so worthy, so worthy. Oh Jesus, Lord, we thank You for these life-giving words that You are the vine and we are the branches, that if we abide in You, You will abide in us and we will bear much fruit. Lord, we want that oil of gladness beyond our companions. Lord, we want heaviness to break. Lord, we want depression to give way. Lord, we wanna see the gifts that You have put in our life. We wanna taste and see that the Lord is good. We wanna see the goodness of God in the land of the living. We wanna see our children skipping and singing. We wanna walk around with a lightness knowing that everything we need is in You. Lord, I pray that You would break the power of the fear of man in this room, that You would bind up that spirit and that people would be released today to experience the joy and the freedom that it is to live for Your approval and Your approval alone. Holy Spirit, come, anoint us with the oil of gladness. Thank You, Father, that You give good good gifts to Your children. We worship You, Lord. We worship You, Lord. You are worthy.